Good afternoon and welcome to the very last session of the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for this session entitled Sweetening the Pot, Incentivizing OERs for Faculty. My name is Sarah Cohen and I am the Senior Managing Director at the Open Education Network. I use the she, her pronouns. If you are not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. I am putting a link to that website in the chat now. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you are so inclined. I am now going to hand it off to Michelle Gibney um, from the University of the Pacific, a member of the Summit Planning Committee, who will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so as we begin this session, we'd like to share a few important details with you. This webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. I'll share the link in the chat in a moment and you can sign up for it. Um, there will be a Q&A throughout today's session as it's sort of a round table and there will be more time for Q&A at the, at the end. Um, to submit a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, we will try to get to all questions uh, as they come in. Uh, the chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions as well. Um, so we are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at uh, z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. I'll put that chat in the link. Um, I put that link in the chat as well. Um, please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. And then the hashtag for the summit is hashtag OEN Summit 21. Uh, you can join us on Twitter at, at open ed underscore network. And I'll put those in chat too. <laughs> and now please join me in welcoming today's presenters. Megan McGregor is the Instruction and Outreach Librarian and Sarah Lucchese is the Coordinator of Research and Instruction Services. Both also serve as members of the Open Educational Resources Committee at their institution, the University of Southern Maine. And I will turn it over to them now. Great, and let me share my screen with everyone. Great. So welcome everyone. Um, I am Megan. Down below me is my colleague Sarah. Um, we're coming from the uh, past and present lands of the Wabanaki up here in Portland, Maine. Um, and today we're going to be talking about uh, sweetening the pot, incentivizing OERs for faculty. So as we go through the presentation today, um, some things we want you to start thinking about is have you incentivized OERs at your, for your faculty? Have you used cash? Have you used a different method to incentivize them? How have you done it? What has worked? What has failed? So we're gonna be talking about some of the stuff we did um, and uh, hopefully we'll be chatting about some of the stuff you did as well. So start thinking about those things. So I will pass it over to my colleague, Sarah, to talk about our OER stuff. Okay, thank you. And I'll have you advance slides for, yeah, you can do the mm -hmm. next slide. So I'm just gonna um, do a brief overview of kind of the, the background of how we've done our open education work at USM and kind of how we led up to our faculty incentivization program in the past couple of years. Um, so you can do the next slide, please, Megan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So uh, we really started our work in earnest in uh, 2018. We had been having some kind of brief conversations about OERs before that and my um, the previous coordinator of research and instruction um, had really become interested in it and, and gone to a couple of conferences and, and brought that information back to USM and, and really advocated for us to, to do some more significant work around open educational resources. So in 2018, we convened a working group and we put together a strategy plan that we submitted to our provost because um, soon after we, we uh, convened our working group, our provost asked us to, uh, to, to be sort of take the lead in the libraries on open education work in, um, at the university. So um, we, our goals were to form an action committee, uh, to increase university-wide awareness of OERs, uh, to do some USM specific data gathering. We had a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of papers out there at the time and results of other surveys um, about the, the impact of textbooks on students and also about faculty attitudes towards OERs, um, but we wanted USM specific data. Um, and then our final goal was to do some adoption and adaptation pilots of OERs at, at USM. So um, we started that work in uh, later on in 2018 and in 2019, we developed a student survey and a faculty survey and, and sent those out for data collection. The student survey focused on the impact of textbook, high textbook costs on their personal and their academic lives. Um, and the faculty survey kind of focused on awareness of OER and how willing they would be to consider using OERs for their courses. So we got some really great data from that. Um, and we used that data to plan some informational workshops for faculty. So um, throughout 2018 and 2019, we were conducting those um, OER 101 informational workshops for faculty. We weren't getting really high attendance. We were getting maybe five or six at each workshop, but those five or six that came left the workshops like really jazzed up to, to do some work about, about OERs. And then in 2019, we learned about an opportunity through the Davis Educational Foundation, um, which is a, a local educational foundation up here in Maine. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit more. So next slide, please. And yeah, so kind of building out is, is um, you know, getting the grant and, and how, how, what we did with it once we got it. Um, so next slide. So the, the Davis Educational Foundation has, um, you can get a, a $10,000, they call it a presidential grant. Um, and you don't have to go through a whole really strenuous application process to get this $10,000 grant. Um, they, they basically just have you write like a two page letter about what you want to do, how it's going to impact your community uh, and and um, what you've done already so far at your institution leading up to, you know, the project that you want to do with with the presidential grant. Um, so it's really meant for sort of pilot programs, um, places that are kind of just starting out to, to explore some kind of uh, educational initiative. So um, we, got the, we got the Davis grant. They were really excited to fund it. Um, we knew from uh, another university in Maine um, had gotten this $10,000 Davis presidential grant to, um, to fund faculty incentives for, for OERs. And so we knew they were already interested in, in that work. So um, they actually, they awarded us the grant within like a week of us sending in the letter, which was really exciting. Um, so we started off with that $10,000 grant um, and we put out, Applicate, or we put out a call for proposals for faculty um, to do either level one, just a purely adopting an existing OER, level two, adapting an OER that is out there for, you know, doing some adaptations for their particular course. Um, so, you know, not just taking it ex exactly as it is, but making some modifications to it to suit their material. Um, and then we had a, a create as well for somebody, for a faculty who wanted to create their own from scratch. Um, so I'll say I'm going to go a little bit more into the application process in the next slides, but we initially didn't have that matching $10,000 from the provost. In fact, we were a little bit worried, you know, knowing as we as we knew that it was proving a little bit difficult to get 
really, you know, large numbers of faculty on our campus interested in OERs, we were worried that we wouldn't get enough of enough applications to cover the $10,000 or we wouldn't get $10,000 worth of applications. We ended up getting $20,000 worth of applications, which we were so excited about. Um, and that's when uh, the provost said she would match the $10,000 that we got from the Davis grant so that um, all of the faculty who are interested in doing this work could could do it. Next slide. So we had a fairly, you know, a fairly low bar application process. Again, we were really worried that faculty that we wouldn't even get enough interest from faculty to, to fill up the $10,000. So we kept the application process really low barrier. Um, I will return to that in the lessons learned for next time. So um, we, you know, we just wanted to know who, you know, who the faculty was, um, what department they were in, what funding level they were applying for. So the um, adopt, adapt, or create. Um, a brief narrative about their project um, and then how they're going to measure their project outcomes. Next slide. And then the way that we advertise this, um, we we have some trouble on our campus getting stuff out to all faculty because there's not like an all faculty listserv that we can send to, but we do have library liaisons to each department and they're, they're used to getting informational stuff from us. Um, so we had all of the library liaisons send it out to their departments. And then we also sent it out to um, the campus wide listserv. Our Center for Technology Enhanced Learning also sends out a newsletter um, to faculty once a week. And so um, we were able to piggyback on that and they, they put the announcement in their, um, their newsletter as well. And then during the time that applications were open, we conducted three of these kind of OER 101 workshops and we, we advertised it through there as well. So I believe I'm turning it back over to Megan now. Yep. So after we put all that stuff, we got stuff back, which was lovely. So we were um, pleasantly surprised as Sarah said about the response to the OER uh, applications. So we got 15 application submissions. Um, and we only granted 11 of them. Of the four that we were basically rejected, we rejected them um, because they either wanted to do something with uh, something that wasn't an OER, so like either an ebook or in one case it was like a Coursera course, like a MOOC, um, or uh, it wasn't very clear what they were trying to do, period. <laughs> so, um, so we rejected those, but basically all the ones that we could accept, we did. And that's where um, the provost came in and granted us that, that basically that matching money to, tr to make sure we could cover everybody that wanted to do something. And it was really nice because we got a very even mix in the different levels. So we had three adapts, uh, three adopts, uh, four adapts, and for create, which we were very surprised about. We didn't think anybody was gonna go for the create, like maybe one very like outrageous person might, but <laughs> we were very surprised that we got such an even keel. Um, it was also really interesting to see uh, where department wise everything fell. We basically kind of hit everybody. So we had like stuff from like music and history all the way over to the other side of the aisle with like biology and engineering. So we got this lovely swath of departments um, for each in, in the, in the three different levels. So while we did get a lovely response and we were able to fund the majority of those uh, issues, of course, did arise. <laughs> um, the biggest one, of course, that we have all experienced uh, was COVID. So basically, the, which me and Sarah were just talking about of when we were reviewing the applications for the uh, for the OER grants, that it was a month in April, af just after we had all gone remote, um, and uh, USM is um, one of those was one of the is one of the universities that we the majority of our classes were not online to begin with, um, unlike a lot of other places that have gone like have like a good swath of online classes. USM was a hundred almost. 100% uh, in person. There was just a very small number of online classes. So all of a sudden uh, we all went remote um, and faculty had to figure out how to uh, teach remotely, um, which a lot of them had never done before. And on top of that, uh, because that wasn't enough, uh, we also that year were supposed to switch our uh, LMS from, we had been using uh, Blackboard um, and then all of a sudden we, we were switching to Brightspace. Uh, the university tried to see if Blackboard would basically float us for another year and they said no. So that summer of 2020, uh, when we had released the grants and where normally we were expecting the faculty would work on them over the summer, 
um, they all of a sudden had to learn a completely new course management system uh, from the ground and learn how to teach online. So it was basically like two double whammies and the faculty were like burnt out to the highest level possible. Um, like every time we met with them over the course of the summer as we were like kind of leading them through the process, um, you could see like the death in their eyes <laughs> as they were going through this um, and trying to grasp <laughs> to, get, to understand the new life we were in uh, along with all of us. Um, and that goes and also the other issue of workload, the amount of workload that the faculty had to take on a lot of them, um, especially in the create level, I don't think had fully understood what it was going to mean to do the thing. Um, so like for and especially on top of all the, the two other challenges that they were suddenly introduced with um, of teaching online and also teaching on a completely on a course management system they had never touched before. Um, we had did have a few who backed down their level. So like had started at like, instead of doing an adapt, they switched back to adopt because it was just too much for them to do. Um, also the level of workload that was uh, foisted onto the OER team uh, was pretty high in that we, so when the, through the process, we basically had periodic meetings with the faculty who had um, been given the grants. So basically to check in, see if we needed to, if they understood what was happening, if they needed any help on things. Um, and unfortunately, because of the way, originally we had planned that um, that help would come from the liaison associated with the department. But unfortunately that ended up being mostly me and Sarah's departments <laughs> in the subjects um, that got OER. So that was uh, an extra workload uh, on top of the other stuff to help guide them through the process and um, make sure they understood what was an OER, why they couldn't use that chapter in a print book or necessarily like that. So that was certainly a process. And I'll let Sarah talk about the bureaucracy side because she got to do this part. <laughs> yes, this was mine. Um, so, uh, so whatever you think you're going to have to deal with in terms of red tape at your university, double it, and and maybe like maybe that will approach what you're actually going to have to deal with. Um, so, a, a major challenge that we ran into was honestly just getting faculty paid on time through the grants. Um, and that had a lot to do with um, the lack of clarity from uh, from payroll at our university about like when we had to submit things in order for them to be able to be rolled into the next pay period. Um, and and to be fair, a lot of that was COVID related as well. You know, we we tried to work out a lot of this ahead of time. Um, you know, to get to get all of the information that we needed ahead of time. Um, but our our normal payroll liaison got reassigned to another area to cover COVID stuff. Um, and so to, we kept getting kind of bopped around, like she said, oh, talk to this other person. And then um, the other person said, oh, no, you actually want to be talking to this person. And so um, we we ran into a lot of hurdles um, that, that kept our faculty from being paid on time, unfortunately. And so um, I, I see in the chat that some some issues here. We can't tell we tell faculty we can't guarantee which pay period the grant stipend will be in. We ran into that as well. I mean, even times when I submitted all the required paperwork to payroll like a week and a half in advance, it still didn't make it into that pay period. Um, so it's it's unfortunate, and I just wish we had known about that ahead of time to be able to warn faculty. Um, like what Justin said, that mm -hmm. that if you can warn faculty ahead of time, um, that that just makes it a little bit easier. Um, so with all of that said, um, some lessons learned for next time, which we're, we're um, hoping to get some additional funding from our provost to be able to offer another round of these to faculty. Um, we, we have realized that a lot more pre-work is, is needed. We wanted to keep the barriers to application low because like we said, we were afraid that we wouldn't get enough faculty interested enough to apply what that ended up what ended up happening with that was we got faculty who said um, oh i would love to adopt a course for my oe or adopt an oer for my course and then they got the grant and then we worked together and did a lot of searching and, and found that there really wasn't something that was already existing out there that they would be able to to adopt um, same thing with with the adapt level they wanted to adapt something for their course but we couldn't really find something suitable for them to adapt and so we had to kind of adjust um, adjust the project uh, since then, I've, I've seen some other uh, faculty grant incentive programs where 
um, they have the faculty do a lot more pre-research ahead of time. So if they're going to adopt something, they have to do the research and identify in their application exactly what resource they're going to adopt or adapt or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, the next time we do this, that's something that we're going to incorporate as well, knowing now that there is enough interest and, and we don't have to keep those barriers to application so low. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that will be something we do. Uh, definitely, you know, like I said, figuring out the payment system in advance. We learned a lot as we went this time around. Um, it, we, we found out after the fact that there are ways to make it a little bit easier. Um, you know, you can divide up the payments and have them kind of automatically um, submitted in the correct months. Um, that does, that does uh, count on the faculty progressing through their project in the timeline that you initially stipulated. Um, so you can you can stipulate at the beginning of the project, okay, the final payment will be made in December. Um, but if the if the payment or if the if the project lags or you know the timeline changes, um, but but you know whatever pre work you can do to figure out how you can make your payments go as smooth as possible uh, on on your campus. And then I think um, we want to build in some additional structures for the period of time when the faculty are working on their projects. This is something we wanted to do for this time around. But again, you know, we keep coming back to COVID, but it's really unfortunate that this was um, happening exactly the same time as, as COVID started. But um, I think faculty would have benefited from some kind of a like a cohort course in Brightspace mm -hmm. um, where we could have put a bunch of uh, resources there for them, had some discussion boards that went along, um, per perhaps some, um, we had we had regularly scheduled meetings one-on-one -on -one with the faculty who are working on these, but I think it would have been good to have regularly scheduled meetings with, you know, groups of faculty who are all working on them so they could have problem solved together. Um, so next time around, we also wanna build in some more structure uh, for faculty during the process of, of working on their projects. Uh, just to give them some some additional support because I think a lot of them um, a lot of them ended up feeling like they were sort of going it alone and I think part of that was just that we were all working from home while we were doing this mm -hmm. um, and so we we all felt more isolated in general but but I think we could give them more structure definitely mm -hmm. um, so that if um, you want to move on to the next slide um, that is sort of our uh, sort of an overview of of our process and, and how we um, how we conducted our mini grant program but um, we we wanted to see uh, sort of from from folks who are attending um, what you have done uh, or if you are considering a grant incentive program and haven't done one yet um, what what questions you have what ideas you have um, what other models that you've looked at that that look really good um, so we wanted to keep part of the the session as sort of a roundtable type discussion for um, for idea sharing and maybe everyone everyone in the audience kind of getting ideas from each other. So um, we would welcome any specific questions that you have for us through the Q and A feature. Um, but we would also welcome folks in the chat kind of sharing out um, whether if you have incentivized OERs for your faculty and kind of how that has gone. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of the comments I'm seeing in the chat so far are about um, same so. Um, someone said ours are our grants are supposed to be paid out this fiscal year, but I highly I'm highly suspicious that they will be in the same boat. It's I'm I'm enjoying the solidarity. It makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> uh, as we wait for some people to add in things, I can I can say for my university since I can unmute myself. Um, we have the same kind of levels, three levels that you do for, but well, we, ours are for review, adopt, adapt, and create. Um, mm -hmm. And we did a cohort space for the first summer that we did it and it worked really well. Like we used our um, LMS for the faculty to all be together. And so, and we had a couple meetings over the summer. Um, this was in 2017, back when we could meet in person. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that worked really well. Um, so, yeah. So. We've done several of the, th the same things you have done. Um, and similarly, the, the simplistic form, uh, we have, we've had to upgrade it over the years to have more mm -hmm. information gathered um, of, of asking them, have they already looked at textbooks or OER text that they want to, to use, adopt? Because um, they can't get that level unless they've already done it. And then we say, do a review uh, um, grant level instead, which is only $250. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we are getting lots of stuff in the chat now mm -hmm. and some questions in the Q and A. Okay. Um, I am scrolling up. <laughs> um, so one question from Amanda Langdon in the Q&A is, I'd love to hear about non-financial incentives. Do, have you tried any of that? That's a great question. Um, we have not. I don't, Megan, have you heard of any? Not really. I mean, we've tried like non-financial incentives in that, like, do you hate the textbook you have or are you just frustrated and would like to do something, um, which is kind of how we got the one music uh faculty member to to come on to as a create because she wanted to create her own stuff for like a basic piano I think it was course so it's it besides like that kind of softness of like wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to worry about xyz um we haven't tried anything else yet uh Christine Arnold asks did working on an OER project count towards service or faculty goals Unfortunately, not for this round, I don't think. Um, I know that, I'm hoping that that's something we can get incorporated into future rounds. I know that our provost is, a, is an extremely strong supporter of OERs, um, as you can kind of tell by the fact that she matched the amount of grant money that we got and um, she's committed to funding the next round through, through her funding. Um, so I'm hoping that then in the future, that's something that, that we can get built in, um, but it was not part of this round. Yeah. Um, yeah, wait, wait, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, and I was just going to say in the chat, Jonathan pointed out that like monetizing the OERs in the end, that becomes such a low pay grade of like, what are they paying like a dollar something for their time? But mm -hmm. yeah, so it is very weird. And that is a discussion going forward of like, is there a better way to do that? But yeah, they work. Yeah, there was more solidarity in the chat too about paying faculty <laughs> is the most significant hurdle, uh, which agreed, because I have trouble mm -hmm. with that too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, another question, do you think in the future you will require faculty to identify in their application the specific OER they will use? Are some happy medium between that and the very low barrier for entry? So I, I have some thoughts, but I can also see in the Q&A that um, Sarah Cohen is interested in answering. So Sarah, I'll let you um, give your thoughts. Oh, okay. Just and, uh, checking. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. There's uh, something little pops up that says like, Sarah Cohen is interested in answering this live. So I was like, okay, she, okay, no, I'm good. <laughs> um, okay. So I would say, um, you know, it's difficult. There may be some kind of a happy medium. Um, you know, I think we what we want to avoid is running into the issue like we have in the past where, um, you know, where faculty say they want to adopt or adapt something and then after they get the grant, it turns out there's really nothing suitable for their class. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to do at least a little bit of pre-work to make sure that there's something suitable that they can use kind of before we award them the grant and they start, you know, getting down the path to, to doing this work. Um, so I don't necessarily know that, you know, they might they might find a couple of options, but they don't have to decide on one until after um, after they get the grant, you know, because that deciding between maybe two or three options might take some more time, you know, reading and, and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, but we want to at least make sure that there's something out there that they could use. Right. Yeah, maybe something along the lines of we it's like a soft introduction to the grant where we say there is a grant coming but for this grant you must have something somewhat selected at which point we introduce them to like the, basically do like a workshop and do maybe something like where they can book an appointment with somebody in the OAR team and something like that and then eventually they can submit the grant what they've kind of like been a slow lead up towards um to to that question about incentive non monetary incentives um Tyler Dunn in the chat from Fort Lewis College in Colorado says that they are looking into um, making efforts toward OER work being recognized in the faculty promotion and tenure process. And they also write letters to departments to recognize mm -hmm. faculty at OER work, which that's great, like to let the deans know, I'm assuming right. your faculty's doing this, it's good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> yeah, any, anytime you can pull it into T&P promotion and tenure is like, that's gold, liquid gold for faculty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, 
So another question is, may I ask how you see the role of the incentive program in the long term? Is it intended to be permanent or is it maybe for a number of years to get an OER movement going on campus? Uh, I'm trying to think through how OER incentive funds are similar to OA APC funds and how they might be different. So. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'll, I can share a couple of my thoughts and then um, I, Megan, you might wanna, if, if you have anything to share too. Um, I think it was sort of the second thing you said where it's meant to be maybe a couple of years just to kind of get enough interest on campus mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of get some, get a few projects that we can then share as examples to, to other faculty. Um, I don't know if there's potential to have it be kind of a, a small scale, but permanent fund, you know, maybe five to $10,000 a year for a couple of faculty a year to do something um, that that may be possible, but I don't know if, um, if the university administration would want to commit to that basically in perpetuity. Um, and you're, you're tying it to open access APC charges is an interesting question because, I mean, that's also frankly another issue that we have at least on our campus and probably um, some of you too, too, actually, I'd be really interested to hear in the chat um, what your campuses are doing about open access APC charges because we don't currently have like a centralized fund anywhere on our campus where faculty can apply to get APC charges paid. Um, sometimes we get questions at the library, sometimes we're able to help with that and sometimes we're not kind of based on how much the, the fund is. But I think a lot of this, these are things that, you know, with, with open access, um, both publishing and OERs um, being being more of a, a thing in the future. I think these are things that a lot of universities are going to have to start to think about how they're going to um, how they're going to fund them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're what we kind of hoped this would do is basically just get people more comfortable with OERs because there is that line that OERs do have a bad rap that they are cheap and trashy. Um, so I think just getting the faculty used to them enough so that they will begin to consider them as opposed to them coming from like absolutely no knowledge at all. And all of a sudden being like, oh, I didn't know we had that. So it'll get over that hump of like, oh, I didn't know that was, a, that was available kind of a thing um, was definitely what we were kind of envisioning this to be. Definitely not a long term. Yeah, we, we found from that faculty survey that we did a couple of years ago that I mean, that, it, was the same, it was the same thing that probably a lot of you are used to hearing from your faculty. The biggest concern that faculty had and biggest barrier that they saw to OER adoption was the, um, they had questions about quality. And of mm -hmm. course we know that, you know, that the quality is good, but for faculty who don't know anything about it. Um, so that's, you know, that was part of what we were going for with the grant incentives and all of the workshops and having, you know, when, when we had our OEN workshop and um, we had, we had a lot of faculty do that workshop and complete reviews afterwards. Um, so that's kind of been an, an aim is to just sort of increase the awareness of faculty on our campus that, that OERs are quality resources. Uh, another question is how much assistance does the OER team give to faculty adopters? Does it vary depending on course? Yeah. Um, it very, I mean, we, so, so we basically worked with each of our adopters one-on-one. -on -one, mm -hmm. And so it, it varied just based on what their particular needs are. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, we had a, probably the kind of bell curve that you would expect. We had a couple faculty who are just off to the races and didn't really need our help with anything except at the very end when they wanted to put it in press books, you know, we, we helped them out with that a little bit. Um, we had a couple of faculty who were way on the other end who really needed a lot of handholding and a lot of additional help um, searching for appropriate resources and, and things like that. But but most were kind of in the middle of the curve where we met with them a couple times throughout the process and then they were able to, to be a little bit more independent in between those meetings. Um, so really it just varied, not necessarily by department, but just based on what that individual faculty needed. Um, and that was frankly another issue where it came, I mean, I think that one-on-one -on -one helpful was, or that one-on-one -on -one work was helpful for faculty, but for future iterations, you know, we had 11 projects, w working one on one with 11 faculty through that process was actually quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so that when we're thinking about the, the size of future endeavors, um, that's something we're going to have to keep in mind too, is like how much, how much staff time it takes to support faculty 
through the process um, in a way that they need. So I guess that's something I would encourage you all to think about too, um, is like how much staff time you have available to support faculty through their projects. Right, because we're not a big force at USM. Like I think what's there, <laughs> we have like seven, seven reference librarians and then me and Sarah, are the only ones who are on the OER team. The OER team is of five people. So <laughs> three of whom are in the library, two of whom are in um, CTEL. So it's a, it's a small crew. <laughs> I will say since I, since I had that cohort experience the first summer that we did it, three of the faculty members were adapting OpenStax textbooks. And because they were in a cohort and they all knew each other, they talked to each other when they had questions about doing the OpenStax conversion stuff. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to help with that and they did it themselves. <laughs> and that was really helpful. So that right. is a plus for cohorts. <laughs> Um, yeah, and there there is chatter in the in the chat about promotion and tenure and like the issues of of some universities like do not recognize. I mean, it's still early days in the promotion and tenure and how you can tie that into um, OERs. Um, but yeah, if you as sometimes they don't recognize it as a like publication. Um, some do. Some are being a little bit forth, a little bit on the edge of that. Um, but yeah, if you can try and do connect it to um, professional development or um, uh, what's the uh, basic it, or, or volunteerism like there's a there's another section of PNT that I'm I'm oh, not uh, service it's the service, service thank you yeah mm -hmm. service yeah. <laughs> if you can connect it into service that too so yeah if, if you can go through if you can find a promotion and tenure um dossier or basically what is expect or guidelines and just fine tooth comb and like be like this this will obviously connect back to that um, that could be very helpful for your faculty because they may not have the imagination and if you just hand it to them be like and this is how OER will fit into your dossier they will very much appreciate that um, we didn't do it this round because things but um, that could certainly be something we could do in the future Certainly. And I did, I appreciate it. I saw, I saw some talk go by in the, um, in the chat about uh, academic freedom and, and how that kind of ties into OER stuff. I, I was actually, I shouldn't have been as surprised as I was, but um, our provost invited me and our library director to a meeting of all the University of Maine system provosts a few months ago um, to kind of talk about our, our OER work. Um, and, and we thought it would be just, you know, where we shared what we do and we answer some questions and stuff. Um, and, and there was like just a lot of feedback about academic freedom. They're, um, they're, they're uh, very wary of folks um, who are not faculty making any kind of appearances like we're trying to tell faculty what to do um, with their teaching. And so I think that's another reason why the, the incentives are great because it's, it's opt-in. So it's not, you know, we're not asking faculty to do anything that's not their their choice. If they wanna, if they want to to embark on this work with us, great. If not, nobody's telling them they have to. Um, so I think um, I think offering incentives like that is a good way for some bottom up growth. Um, you know, rather than uh, advocating in a way, I you know, you it's um, there's there's so much line towing that goes on when you're trying to to advocate for faculty to do something or to to share with them the benefits of doing something um, without kind of stepping over the line into um, into concerns about academic freedom. Uh, a third one that I'm not sure has come up is that if you can get your associated student union to work with you on this, they mm -hmm. might want to give a, an excellence and OER award to a faculty member every year. And then that would be something they could use in P&T under an award or service area too. So that's an option. And we do have another question. Um, so do you plan to repeat the OER survey anytime soon? Is it something you would do regularly every year, every couple of years, et cetera? Yes, we actually did. We just discussed this with the OER working group a couple of weeks ago. We do want to redo the survey probably this coming academic year. Mm -hmm. um, for the, I mean, it's been three years now since we've done it. And so we have, a, you know, a whole new crop of students. Um, and it's, you know, we've had a fair number of new faculty in that time. And, you know, potentially our, our work with the workshops and, um, and 
and the the incentive program and things like that might have started to um, to have faculty a little bit more aware of, of OERs. And so um, we're hoping to see changes in both the improvements in both the, the student survey and the faculty survey. But yes, that's a really good question. And we do want to do that again. And there was a clarifying question in chat of double checking your OER committee doesn't have any faculty on it. That's correct right now. We have not been able to get, um, we've, we have, so we have our kind of core working committee and then we have a larger um, sort of advisory committee. Um, the advisory committee has not met since COVID because everybody's been um, busy with 10,000 other things. Um, but, but our core committee um, doesn't have faculty on it just for the sense that we couldn't get any faculty to commit um, to, to being part of that group. But I, I agree, I think that would be a really uh, important addition. Yeah, there's several other comments that are saying faculty yeah. are critical to success. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's, yes. Totally agree, yeah. yeah. I'm double checking if I've missed anything in chat. There were other questions. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it went it went a lot. There was a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is great. I'm 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 thrilled that um, that folks are sharing their experiences. Mm -hmm. I'm I will to, add. For, sorry, go ahead. I'm curious to see what is going to happen with OER post pandemic because everybody's been remote. So all of a sudden, everybody has understood the how how easily they could have transitioned <laughs> if they had just had an OER textbook of some sort rather than a physical textbook because like the library was shut down as all libraries were so like there were students who were like can we get the textbook and we're like you can't because it's physical and we can't hand this over the desk to you so I'd be, and maybe faculty who hadn't experienced the uh, the trauma of um, e-textbooks all, with like codes and all that shenanigans, I wonder if they've realized um, that maybe there's a that maybe OER is the answer to fixing some of the headaches that maybe have they didn't realize were there post post COVID pre COVID. Um, there's another question for: Is there a process for peer review for the ones you're doing now, or for class testing? Um, not currently. Um, No, we, I mean, we, so as the, for, for folks who created, you know, we, as the, the um, librarians saw those and, and, um, you know, just kind of checked them. Um, but yeah, I think as uh, Rebel just put in the chat, we only required peer review for publishing in the press. And I think it was the same. Um, we, you know, like a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of what we planned um, on for this project kind of went by the wayside because of of COVID, and so um, we were we were hoping to follow up a little bit more with um, you know class outcomes and some of that you know class testing, like you said. Um, but uh, I think we probably missed the boat on that for this round, but mm -hmm. but definitely something that will be as an improvement for the next round. Awesome, thank you. And then I, I have a question. Do you, are you doing, requiring anything from the faculty about surveying their students at the end of the course about what the students thought about the OER that they was used that semester? <laughs> yeah, I think that's another thing we probably want to um, incorporate for next time. We, um, again, because, because right as faculty were about to be embarking on these projects, um, they were all of a sudden having to learn a brand new LMS and learn how to teach online. Um, they were really um, uh, concerned about, about teaching online. And I think that got sort of the majority of their interest. And so uh, a lot of the projects were heavily modified from what the original plan was. Um, and so we uh, didn't do as much of the the kind of after the fact follow up as we would have otherwise, just yeah. because you know knowing that a lot of the projects ended up kind of not um, not what the faculty originally envisioned. Yeah, they were burnt out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sounded terrible. Like 
-hmm. the pandemic was terrible, but also a new right, yeah, like the, the LMS. It was really like deadness in the eyes, so hard, and you could just yeah. see them melting before you. It was pretty bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm seeing in the chat, like Larry saying, in in West Virginia, anyone who applies for an open textbook adoption, one requirement is that the students are surveyed and the results conveyed. Um, I think that's a really excellent mm -hmm. idea. And you know, this was this was already going to be a pilot project for us, and then when uh, throwing COVID into the mix, it ended up being like an extra, extra, extra pilot. Um, so, so we're learning a lot from um, you know from what you guys are putting in the chat, and just from our what our experiences were from from this pilot. Um, so I, I think that was I think yeah a lot a lot of the suggestions that we're that we're getting here are going to be really useful for us. Yeah, and then um, I can see Rebels, we required faculty feedback and engagement to encourage the next round. That's also something that we intended to build into this one is, um, you know, once faculty were finished with their OER project, they would kind of, we would do a showcase, we would do like a faculty OER showcase um, as kind of a method of recruiting for, for future mm -hmm. faculty OER efforts. Um, again, didn't happen for uh, all the reasons that we've went on at length about, but um, but yeah, I think that's an, a really great idea and something that we're definitely going to incorporate into into next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes the storytelling of student feedback is is helpful when you're mm -hmm. asking. I know you said the provost is very supportive, but yeah. when you're asking for money, it's sometimes useful than rather than definitely. just the qu the quantitative data of how much money has been saved and whatever. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you, more questions, do you, do you have a timeline for the next round? Um, yes and no. Um, we actually know uh, we're going to be meeting with our provost sometime in the next probably three weeks or so to talk about, um, talk about the next round. She's just, she's going to be funding the next round herself. Um, so, so she, you know, we have some thoughts about what we submitted a proposal to her about what we wanted the next round to look like. Um, she had some, you know, she said, oh, I like this part, but not this part. And so um, we're going to meet to kind of hash all that out. So our next round is, is hopefully going to kick off fairly soon. Awesome. And then uh, have you identified any grantees as potential faculty champions? Uh, they're essential in our effort. Faculty listen to faculty. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, yeah, there were a couple. I mean, like I said, a lot of folks really ended up not being able to give it the amount of effort that they originally wanted, but there were there were definitely a couple of standout rock stars. And so, mm -hmm. yes, we're, we're going to be enlisting them. <laughs> Will you allow faculty that got a grant one year get another one? Like, will they get the repeat awardees? That's a good, I think that's probably mm -hmm. one of the questions that's on the discussion board for discussion with the provost. Um, I know some faculty you know, like I said, because of everything that that happened, um, they didn't they didn't get as far in their project as they wanted to. You know, they wanted to do an adapt, and they got like a half adapt. You know, um, and so I we've we've had questions from faculty who didn't get as far as they wanted if there was going to be you know if they could apply for the next round. Um, so it'll just be sort of what. Um, how comfortable the, the provost is with that. It's, I can see it going both ways, you know, like you want, you want to support the faculty to complete their projects. Um, and then if, but then if the, the part, one of the stated goals is to get more faculty into the fold, you know, you see the benefit also of, of having a whole new slate the next time around. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there are pros and cons to each. Uh, I absolutely agree. I, we at my institution, several faculty have gotten multiple grants, but for different courses. Mm -hmm. um, and then some do, because we have that review level, if they do a review, we do encourage them to do an adopt, adapt the next year. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. So that, that seems fair, but, right, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is, it is like, I do regret a little bit, not, I don't regret it, but I am worried a little bit about what you said about not having wider dispersal amongst all of the departments because ours is very heavy in STEM, like mostly mm -hmm. we have done OERs for STEM and you, your first year, you had a lot of different disciplines, which was represented, which was really good. And I think that was mostly chance. I mean, I don't think we did yeah. a, any better job advocating in some disciplines than others. I think that just happened to be how it fell out. So. Mm -hmm. 
Did you like, did, did you already know the, about what, the people that did apply for your first round? Did you already know some of them were like interested in OER and reached out to them specifically? Or did you just send out the call and it was just whoever replied? Both, a little bit of okay. both. Um, we knew, I mean, some, some faculty who came to those workshops were like, I'm totally in, I want to do this, I'm super excited. Um, and so those, you know, we did one-on-one -on -one outreach for those and just said, hey, just so you know, like our, our applications are open. But then we did that that wide call as well. And we, yeah, we had a few faculty who apply who he had no idea OER was even on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, so it was great. It was, it was nice to have a mix of both. So we do have 10 more minutes if anyone has more questions or they want to share things that have worked and failed uh, at their institutions. The chat has slowed down, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to the end of the day on Friday. Yeah. Oh yeah, so Carol right. said, I think it matters that the library liaisons connected with their faculty, like a targeted special invitation. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've, we've found that for sure, that the more, the more faculty feel like we're asking them specifically, not just putting a general call out there. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm Do actually, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask when you sent those letters, when the library liaison sent the letters, was it just, there's a OER grant application, apply for it. Or did they include any resources for that specific discipline? Because I've seen that mm -hmm. happen. Um, and that's sometimes helpful because then they're like, oh, that would be perfect for my course. And then they apply because they saw it already. Right, right. Um, I don't think we included, I don't think we included discipline specific resources in our call. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, I'd be curious to hear, so um, for folks, who either don't have a library, you know, if, you're, if your library doesn't do the liaison thing, or if you do, but that's not like a normal way that you communicate with faculty, um, we, we definitely are looking for additional ways to get the word out to faculty. I feel like no matter what, there's always, you know, you wanna diversify your, your communication channels. Um, so I'd be curious to hear some, some thoughts in the chat about, or just some what you've done in the past in the chat to, um, connect with faculty about stuff like this besides, you know, just emailing the departments and kind of sending out a whole university-wide email about it. So there are a couple of new questions in chat, but I, yeah. do you give a, a review grant or is that possibly directed at, because I don't remember yours. Having we don't a do a review grant. Okay. That might've been a question for you. I will write in chat about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, but then there was do you make requirements about the finished products of the work? So if they're doing a create level grant, do you ask them to put it on a particular platform with a particular license, things like that? Right. Um, we don't require a specific platform just because we don't have like, we don't have a university subscription to press books or anything like that. Um, so we ourselves don't necessarily have a, a centralized platform. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a requirement that it be made accessible and you know open in some way so like one one faculty decided to use part of the grant money that he got to spend the 99 dollars to have it put on press books um someone one other faculty just made like a website um and and you know so there were different ways there um but we don't require we require it to be released under some kind of creative commons license so not you know not like copyrighted obviously because they're they're making an oer um but but we don't require a specific cc license that's part of the the education that we do is like in our initial meeting with faculty we we give them a lot of information about the different creative commons licenses and what each one does so you know what each one allows um and then that's kind of part of what their their work in the the process is figuring out what creative commons license they want to release it under so yes, Jonathan, we do, we do allow no derivatives licenses. Um, we, you know, we talk to them about it. We, we inform them about it and kind of give them the, the pros and cons and, and what might, you know, what, what a no derivatives license prevents other people from doing, um, but we don't prohibit that from doing, prohibit them from doing that. There was something in the chat earlier too about uh, getting departments to agree on a single textbook and giving a grant to a department. Mm -hmm. um, and that has worked for some of their math and chemistry. Oh, that's a really uh, good idea. Yeah. 
and I think assume that it's a bigger grant yeah. <laughs> to the entire department. Um, so that's cool. Um, yeah. And then stuff about using social media mm -hmm. uh, during Open Education Week and Open Access Week and lib guides for in information. Um, and then a new question, does the faculty author get the grant money at the end? Do they have to give it back if they don't complete the project? If it's a department of several authors working on one project, how is the grant divided up? Have you run into any of those things? Yeah. Um, I feel like Megan, if you want to say, I, I feel like I've been monopolizing the question answers. I feel bad about it, but if <laughs> I can, I'm so happy no. to talk about this or. Yeah, then no, we, um, we only had, we only had one department do it is that right i'm trying yeah, to think one like group which, yeah yeah which was like there well two i take that back two groups because there was the um learning commons and history oh right yeah yeah. that was it so the learning uh commons which is kind of like our they do tutoring and um they i think the writing center is also like roped under them they do a bunch of like uh student preparation stuff they decided to do an OER, um, and then our other group that did it was the um, history department wanted to adopt American YOP um, for their like basic history, like I think like 200 and then 200.2 level classes. Um, so we gave, I don't, and I don't know how we ended up paying it out because I wasn't on that side of it for the grant work. Yeah, we ended up, I mean, uh, each, each, they applied per project. And so mm -hmm. if, if four faculty together applied for a project that they got $2,000 for, um, mm -hmm. you know, they each got $500. And so, so we funded the project um, regardless right. of how many people were, were working right. on it. And then, and then we did. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And then we, we basically, we, we parceled out the, mo the money like as they went. So they got like part of it. At, we basically talked to them initially in meetings and said, okay, so what are the goals for this? How about by June, you have this much of it done? How about by August, you have this much of it done? And basically talk to them about how they wanted it and or needed it to be parceled out if like they were going to use the money for some something they were going to use to create the OER in some way. Um, so it was kind of like we carefully like drifted out. We didn't just say like, here's the cash. Good luck to you. <laughs> Hope for the best. We basically like held it out until they got there and kind of did a breadcrumb trail for them. Yeah. It ended up, I mean, our goal was to have like, we pay them half when they're halfway done and then mm -hmm. the rest when they're finished. Mm -hmm. um, a couple, if, given the scope of the work, there were a few people that we divided it up into thirds instead of half, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. yeah. Everyone, we are uh, just coming up on time now. What a rich conversation this has been, um, especially um, all the things that you've added in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. I can't imagine a nicer way to kind of end the summit with a conversation that continues to be um, important to so many of us as we continue to develop our programs. And um, it's wonderful to hear so many people's perspectives and the different ways in which you're trying to tackle this challenge. So thank you so much to Megan and Sarah um, for leading this session, for sharing your expertise and your experience with us. Um, and thank you all of you who are in attendance. Um, we will remind you today's session has been recorded. So we will be putting that um, up along with a transcript um, on our YouTube playlist. Um, and so you can actually sign up um, to receive a notification um, when that is ready. I've just put the link um, into the chat. Um, and then I, it seems like there's a lot of conversation behind this. Please, we hope you will keep the conversation going. Um, members, this is always a vibrant conversation in the Google group. Um, for everyone, our Slack channel continues to be a space where we can um, have this conversation. And I also want to give a shout out to Michelle for facilitating today's session as well and adding so much to the conversation. Thank you. Everyone, this concludes our session and the 2021 summit. Thank you so much for making this year's summit terrific. And it is a pleasure um, to spend this time with you. And we hope that we will see you in all of these spaces moving forward. Thank you.